Good morning. Thank you for joining us for today. My name is Jeff Sharp. I'm the director of the Ohio State School of Environment and Natural Resources. I'm delighted to see such a, uh, a large audience um, um, here today. And, and uh, um, I know this morning and then this, um, later this morning we'll have a great, some great programming for you. So I'm delighted to invite you here to uh, um, participate in this. Um, I know you're all eager to hear from our two distinguished speakers this morning, so I will keep my remarks brief. I want to start by acknowledging our school's Terrestrial Wildlife Ecology Lab and Ohio Department of Natural Resources, Ohio Division of Wildlife for their collaboration with the Environmental Professionals Network to help shape and facilitate the several components of today's breakfast program and additional activities, including a very exciting workshop and lunch program occurring here in this room later today. Please turn to the back of your program to read the professionals in the audience that through EPN's registration process choose to support today's participating students. Many thanks to all of you for your support. One of the um, exciting things that we are delighted to be able to do through the Environmental Professionals Network is network um, students with uh, professionals. So hopefully some of you, uh, um, we interspersed you and, and some of you had a chance to visit with some of the, uh, the students here at Ohio State University. They're interested in probably the same fields that you're working in. So uh, for those of you that are students in the audience, could you raise your hand just so we could see how many are here? Yes. It's great to see so many of you here, and I appreciate that it's early for you and it's uh, um, getting late in the semester, so uh, I know it was probably a, a taxing sort of a, um, uh, effort to get here, but these networking opportunities pay off. We do are aware of people that have actually successfully landed leads for jobs in the past. Um, these contributors that help sort of support these students, along with funds from, our school and school, from the school and the Sustainability Institute at Ohio State University, have made registration free for all students attending today. And a big thank you and welcome to the students in the audience who I know are balancing midterms and the many other activities that you're tasked with at this point in the semester. A little background on today's program. When I first met with Bob Gates, who's in the audience, about ways to utilize support we've received from external supporters to advance the wildlife program, uh, a number of ideas have been tossed around. So I appreciate that the, uh, um, through the generous contributions of, of some of you, as well as uh, we had a legacy gift um, that was given to us to support wildlife, uh, we've had some resources that we can invest. And I appreciate um, Bob and the uh, um, um, 12 group for brainstorming ways that we could um, uh, invest in sort of advancing the, uh, the profession and uh, adding value to the state of Ohio's efforts to sort of like work on wildlife conservation. So um, we discussed a number of ways to do that. Um, using uh, One possibility, using the EPN for a forum as a space to convene a dialogue on critical issues impacting wildlife, and this is the result. So I appreciate the, uh, the contributions of some of you that maybe have contributed to our wildlife program, and uh, um, um, we're delighted to have you um, um, participating as well. Also, last year's staff from the Division of Wildlife reached out to the EPN about considering the specific topic area of funding mechanisms. The aligning conversation between our 12 lab and the staff from um, Division of Wildlife over the past six months, along with the contributions from Naomi Edelson, one of our speakers today, have been critical to the program we have this morning. Please take a look at the outline of today's program in the brochure at your table. There you will find an agenda featuring who will be speaking on what topics and at what times. In the pages following the agenda, you will find professional bios for our two P EPN breakfasts, and we will not read those today. You can just um, read along and, and identify them yourself. First to speak will be Chief Kendra Wecker, the Chief of OIDNR's Division of Wildlife, and she will be followed by Naomi Edelson, Senior Director for Wildlife Partnerships for the National Wildlife Federation, and then an audience Q&A with both speakers. Please welcome Chief Wecker. Thank you, Jeff. I appreciate that warm welcome and introduction. Um, so thank you for coming this morning and talking about uh, wildlife conservation and funding of wildlife conservation. It's a great story, and it needs to continually be told, and it's something that um, we are eager to share with you. So today, I was going to talk about, give you some information to think about to start this off, history of conservation funding. What do we do in the Division of Wildlife? How do we do it with the funding that we have? And where do we go from here after today's conversations? So a lot of people like a diverse array of wildlife. And they want to see beautiful things out in the nature. But the question comes, who pays for conservation? And I want you to think about that. Because most people think that everyone pays for it through their general taxes. But that is not true. This is the kind of person that pays for conservation, hunters, anglers, trappers. They are the ones who purchase licenses and permits who willingly come forward and ask for fee increases so they can pay more to support 
habitat and the wildlife that they want to see. She also pays for conservation. She too is a hunter. And, you know, by hunting, and, and whether you are supportive of it or not, just think about this. You know, by her hunting that deer, she has just obtained the best free range, 100% uh, organic lean protein that you can have. And she's going to take that home to her family and share that. So she has become more in tune with the land, more in tune with nature, and understanding of the different changes that are out there in, the, in conservation. But she's also paying for the beautiful birds that we see out there. She too pays for conservation. She purchases an Ohio Wildlife Legacy stamp. And this is an opportunity for people who may not hunt and fish, or you know, may not want to hunt and fish, but they can support financially in conservation. And this legacy stamp is modeled after the, after the wetland habitat stamp. And it too pays for all the beautiful things that we see out there in nature. So if you like to get out there, <clears throat> I want to urge you to make sure that you're paying for conservation as well. It doesn't happen by the grace of God. It happens by active wildlife management, and it ha happens because people have stood up and they stand for supporting fish fiscally wildlife conservation. This group here, anglers, they too stand and pay for conservation. They have, th this particular group was out uh, enjoying the walleye boom this, this year on Lake Erie. So if you haven't been to Lake Erie, it is phenomenal walleye fishing season. It's gonna be great for the next 10 plus years, so make sure you get to, to Lake Erie if you haven't done that already. But they too, with their licenses and permits that they purchase, they are paying for boat ramp access. And all kinds of people use these boat ramps. All the paddlers, kayakers, canoers, anybody that gets on water uses these boat ramps. And they're paid for by anglers. So today, I'd like to also ask, who in this room is, has a, a fishing license? Raise your hand. Hunting license? Or buy a legacy stamp? OK. The, look around you, and those people that buy fishing and hunting licenses are the ones you can talk to if you're interested in trying to pursue hunting or fishing. So we are constantly trying to get more people outdoors. Part of our, our, our promotion is just to ask somebody to go new with us and make sure that we are being inclusive and add more people into the fold of participating in wildlife conservation. So going back, before you can move forward, I think it's always good to reflect on history. And we all know, I think to some degree, that history um, dictates where you go. And historically, um, when people came to North America, um, obviously Native Americans were here and they were utilizing wildlife in a very productive manner um, and not over utilizing it. Well, when people started to settle this country from Europe, which most of us probably originated from Europe somewhere, our ancestors came over here and it was a you know, free-for-all. They came from a world where wildlife be belonged to the nobility. So when they got over here, they, they just kind of went nuts. <laughs> they took advantage of everything, hunted and fished and trapped, and consumed everything that they could. And you know, this left you know, many images of, of declining wildlife, but they thought it was so plentiful that there's no way they could ever run out of it. So you know, again, going back to their origins of European uh, people where wildlife belongs to nobility, you know, you couldn't, you couldn't go out and participate in taking wildlife unless you were part of that nobility. So most of us here probably would never have been able to touch it. And through the years, um, when you came to North America and they were consuming wildlife, you know, people were picking up uh, the feathers, they were using those as part of their decoration. And of course, you can never go, um, you know, Women's fashion is always the, 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 the epitome of taking things to the extreme, right? So there, having a whole piece of taxidermy on your head was quite fashionable. And so with that, um, you know, people used and consumed too much of the wildlife, and it was all free and there for the taking. But the last straw came when flocks of, you know, the passenger pigeon and the buffalo were basically to a level that they could not see them anymore. And people realized that we have got a problem. And so any talk about the history of conservation funding would be um, derelict if you didn't mention some of the people who had that vision back in the day and realized we have a problem and we have to solve it. And the only way we're gonna solve it is if we stand up and take care of this ourselves. So definitely have to give some shout outs to Teddy Roosevelt and John Muir, Gifford Pinchot, George Berg Grinnell, Leo Aldepold, some of the historical founding fathers of wildlife conservation and the conservation um, success and recovery.
So when they realized we had a certain you know, major problem, they continued with trying to implement national and state regulations and some funding. So with state and federal regulations, you have agencies now that are there to, uh, who are, uh, they employ professional wildlife managers, and they are the ones here to manage wildlife on behalf of the general public. So we can't all be armchair biologists, but we certainly have a lot of them out there because we hear from them quite daily on how we need to do things a different way. But we have um, a variety of state and federal wildlife uh, conservation organizations that are taking care of the wildlife on behalf of all of us. We also have a number of conservation groups that are nonprofits that hopefully a lot of you are members of, and they too are assisting us. But the one thing that they don't have is they don't have the authority to be the regulator and the authority to make some of those changes. They have to work with their state and federal partners. So just a little breakdown here in Ohio of how we were originated and, and started. We began as the Ohio Fish Commission in 1873. And um, it evolved into a number of name changes until we became officially the Division of Wildlife in 1949. So what does the Division of Wildlife do? Our mission, is to conserve, improve fish and wildlife resources and habitats for sustainable use and appreciation by all. And I want to focus on that word all. Even though we focus quite a bit on hunting, fishing, trapping, we also spend a lot of time and effort on bird watching and getting people outdoors into the habitat that we have. We want to have sustainable populations for the enjoyment of all public. And if the populations are low, we want to increase them. If the populations are too high, we work through management strategies, hunting regulations, season lengths, bag limits, to try to reduce some of the populations that are a little too high in the game arena. Our responsibility, again, for Ohio's wildlife, it's, it's quite extensive. Um, we, may, we may not be um, the western states with some of the huge megafauna, but we have a variety of wildlife that um, attracts a lot of people to Ohio. We are, we are well known for our large-bodied deer. Um, we have a thriving population of turkeys, we have successful uh, fish uh, community, and uh, a lot of people want to come to Ohio just to bird watch. We have McGee Marsh Wildlife Area, one of the top 10 birding locations in the, in the country, uh, right here you know, on the shores of Lake Erie. So we have a pretty big responsibility to take care of all of these wildlife. And so how do we do that? We're, we're broken as an agency into several different sections. Actually, it's really five sections. Um, wildlife management is the first one I'll talk about. And with wildlife management, we are constantly monitoring populations, setting the annual hunting regulations to ensure sustainable harvest, and we're doing a lot of habitat management. And habitat management is active management. It doesn't mean you just have a piece of property and you let it be. If you, if you let it be, it's going to change and evolve over time, but you're also going to lose the dynamics of the certain habitat qualities that the population of animals there may use. So if it's a, if it's a grassland, you need to do active cutting, or burning to maintain that grassland, to keep your woody invasives out. If it's a wetland, you may need to have water control structures, which are very expensive, to run the water levels to make sure the, the levels are up when they need to be up and down when they need to be down. So we have beautiful wildlife here. Besides the charismatic megafauna that we take care of, we also are really into pollinators and trying to produce, produce better habitat on the landscape. So if we have more pollinator habitat, we have more insect, biodiversity, we have more food for all the way up the food chain. So it's, it's very wise to make sure that we focus on all levels and not just one level of habitat. And so with the management, um, we do active burning and a lot of people sometimes don't understand why do you do that and it's part of, again, active management. So you have to have these um, uh, mechanisms in, in place to maintain that habitat to keep the biodiversity that you're that you're seeking. And so after a burn, this is what you can have very quickly. <clears throat> and so again, it's constantly telling the general public and encouraging and educating them about these um, strategies that we do, because a lot of them, they are removed from nature, they don't understand why do you do these things, and they think it's detrimental or um, not a good, uh, good use of your time. So it's a constant public relations um, issue. So both in wildlife management and uh, fish management, our other um, wildlife um, pillar, uh, we deal a lot with endangered species, endangered and threatened species. And of course, this is probably the, the most number uh, one 
um, thing that people come to our website for. They come to find out information about endangered species. So I think par partly because a lot of students are doing reports on endangered species and they need information. So we know that and we try to put a lot of information out there and we deal with everything from the beautiful bald eagles to the federally endangered American bearing beetle and we care about all of it. And of course on our aquatic side, lake sturgeon and hellbenders are some of our um, our flagship species that we're working actively working on, and we put a lot of time and effort into these, these critters, as we should. So in fish management, you can't get any more glorious than sitting there untying knots and, and nets and things like that. So all, all of you that are in the natural resources field, hoping to get a job, just know that you, know, you will do some hard work, and it's pretty labor intensive, and I think I hear some chuckles out there in the audience. But fish management is um, you know, active management. Again, you have to be in the field, you have to be counting, data analysis, surveying, inventory, and making sure that uh, populations are where they should be. And then of course we also, we grow a lot of fish. We have fish hatcheries where we raise fish, and I think last year's number was, I want to say 48 million, and I think I saw Scott Hale somewhere, so if I'm not right, Scott, is it 48 million or more? We're a bit more? Okay. Every year we raise the bar. So that's a lot of fish, and we stock different lakes with these fish. And so why do we do that? Why do we stock fish? Um, it's probably a very common question we get. And again, all these people that purchase um, fishing licenses, they have an expectation that they're going to be able to go out and fish or you know, find the animals that they're looking for, and we need to supplement some of these populations because they aren't naturally reproducing to the levels on their own that we would like to have them. So we can grow them uh, fairly inexpensively in our hatcheries and, and put them in the water so that people can enjoy them and partake and be out in nature. So besides this, the game species, um, and I already mentioned a little bit about pollinators and diversity, we do care about all wildlife. And so when you can get a large group of wildlife biologists and technicians in the field to go out there and look for timber rattlesnakes, you know you have success in your agency, that they're there voluntarily, they weren't assigned, and they wanted to come and see these, these timber rattlesnakes. So we, it's one of our venomous snakes here in Ohio. And we're really glad to be partnering with Ohio State to take a survey and inventory of our snakes because we, we we're very concerned about them. Obviously, they've been persecuted for many years. They're a rattlesnake. But they're um, a top-tier predator on the landscape. And uh, we didn't really know how many we had out there. So partnering with um, Bill Peterman here with Ohio State and his graduate students, they're out there surveying and looking. And they have found more than we ever expected. So we're really happy. To, to, to know that. And again, we aren't everywhere in every inch of Ohio. So you need to spend the time and the money to go out there and find these animals and make sure we have a good handle on our population. So besides wildlife management, those are the, again, the two groups that um, determine our level of populations and what we can take. We also have law enforcement. And we have wildlife officers in every county and they enforce the laws and just to let you know, probably some people say, well, if you need more money, why aren't you out there just writing more tickets? Well, that's not our philosophy. And although maybe some people who have received a ticket might think that, um, but I can tell you uh, every month I see the, the reports that come in and they contact a lot of people and less than 1% of the people they contact receive a ticket. So they are out there educating and assisting and helping people more than writing tickets. Obviously, we spend a lot of time also on human-wildlife conflict. Um, these populations that we have helped bring back, um, some of them have adapted so well that they become a nuisance. And we really don't want people to not like wildlife. But unfortunately, that occurs, and we need to, to help all kinds of people in dealing with their conflicts. We also produce a lot of research and publications. And we have many, many educational materials that we try to get out to the public and show them you know, the beauty of nature and wildlife and um, participate and try to be the go-to agency that they come to for this information. And we share these kinds of field guides with our partners as well to give out during programs. Beyond materials, we also provide funding. So this is an example here where we pro provided $150,000 to Ducks Unlimited to do wetland habitat restoration up in uh, Canada. And that's where, you know, a lot of waterfowl, it's their breeding, prop, breeding um, 
areas, and they need to obviously have good breeding areas. So we partner with a lot of different conservation organizations, and here are some of the probably the top five that receive probably the most money from us, uh, besides Ohio State, because we do partner with Ohio State quite a bit. And then how do we do it in terms of all this responsibility for all those wildlife? And I'm going to have to talk fast here because I'm getting those signals shortening up. But how do we do it? Because it's a big responsibility. So going back a little bit in our funding, um, some of you this will be a history lesson, and some of you probably know about it. But back to those fellows that I showed, the older fellows back in history. Um, in 1937, there was an outcry to basically pay for conservation. They know it wasn't going to happen overnight without funding. You have to have funding. So in 1937, the Pittman-Robertson Act was created where manufacturers of outdoor equipment, particularly firearms and ammunition, hunting equipment, they pay this 11% excise tax, pass it on to you, the customer, and then they provide it to the, the divisional wildlife or the other state wildlife agencies via the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. So this mechanism, they said, we stand up and we're going to pay for this. We, we need money and um, we need to make sure that we're supporting conservation. Well, the money that we have generally supports 15% of the species that we have in Ohio. So 15% of the species are what we hunt, fish, and trap. That leaves 85% of the species that do not have significant dedicated funding. So those 85% of, of the other species do benefit greatly from the money we have spent on the hunted species and the fish species because they benefit whenever you do habitat work. It's, they're they're going to they're gonna be there. But we could use a little more money to help take care of these animals. And so how are we going to do that? Um, on the fishing side, there's the Dingle Johnson Act, created 20 years later in 1957, and that's an excise tax on fishing equipment to fund sport fishing activities. So again, if you're an angler, you are um, helping pay for conservation. We have very limited funding for the wildlife diversity species. And again, wildlife diversity are the collection of animals separated from the ones we hunt, fish, and trap. So that's kind of easy way to, to term it, is wildlife diversity. And currently, we receive um, state wildlife grants, which is from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, at $1.2 million per year. And this is something we had to advocate for. Um, we worked on it probably 20, 18 to 20 years ago. And Congress, because we, we beat down the doors, <laughs> they finally gave us a little bit of money. And truly, $1.2 million is really a Band-Aid. We have to go for it every year. It's an annual appropriation. We have to justify it. We have to fight for it. And it takes a lot of time and effort to do that. Some of you are familiar with the Endangered Species Act. Well, with the Endangered Species Act, we have what's called Section 6 Endangered Species Money. And so for the whole list of endangered species, we in Ohio get $60,000 a year. So that's not very much money to take care of endangered species, and we have to share it with the plants, the plant people. So you can see where it's, it's, it, it's hard to accomplish a lot with a little limited budget. So just to give you, peel back the curtain here a little bit on the Division of Wildlife budget, um, we have a fairly, you know, robust budget, <clears throat> but I wanted to point out that um, for the money that we take in from the, from the general public, it is 1% of our budget for wildlife diversity and endangered species. And we acquire that money through a variety of mechanisms. Um, the tax checkoff program, so when you file your taxes, you can make a donation to us. We also have cardinal and bald eagle license plates, so anybody in the audience that has one, thank you very much. Um, that money goes right into the diversity fund. And then we have the Ohio Wildlife Legacy Stamp that I mentioned earlier. And of course, we do receive donations and memorial contributions, which is all super helpful. So we make that money stretch. We combine that with the 1.2 from the state wildlife grants. And basically, we have a $2 million budget for endangered and threatened species. So let's focus on some of the species success stories, because I think we do much better when we offer the incentive of money to pay for these things rather than the, the the carrot is better than the stick, right, as far as trying to make people do things. So the Lake Erie water snake is a recovery success story. It has been removed from the endangered species list due to a tremendous amount of work and outreach and convincing people that snakes are worthy of saving. And uh, um, that's Dr. Kristen Stanford, also an OSU employee. Bobcats have, um, all these species have come off our endangered species list because, or been delisted, or downlisted, because they're doing so much better. And again, because we've invested in them, we've put our money into them, and they're doing so much better. 
other species that we're continuing to work on, freshwater mussels, hellbenders, lake sturgeon, and of course the monarch butterfly. And if you're, you know, you know monarch butterflies are, ha are imperiled at this point, they're having a hard time, and we have put a lot of time and resources into trying to bring them back, and a lot of it's been public awareness. And so putting the habitat on the ground and um, working with people is the primary way that we are gonna be successful. Um, Ohio is 95% privately owned, and we have to work with private landowners in order to make landscape scale change for wildlife conservation. So part of that $1.2 million I talked about from state wildlife grants from Congress, they said, well, we're gonna give you this money, but we also want you to have a plan on how you're gonna spend the money. We don't just wanna give you a, a check. So all states were tasked with, with developing a state wildlife action plan. In Ohio, we have our plan. It's over here on my um, table. If you wanna see it, it's about two inches thick. It's very comprehensive. And um, so we have the plan, but we don't have the funding for the plan, and that's where we're at today. And we, the plan focuses on those five items there, species, habitats, threats, actions, and monitoring or reporting. And we are ready to roll. So the two funding mechanisms I've, I've, I have mentioned, we are on the horizon of a third funding mechanism that Naomi is gonna talk about today called Recovering America's Wildlife Act. We call it RAWA for short. But Recovering America's Wildlife Act is the title. And it will essentially be the third leg of the conservation funding stool that we so desperately need to balance the needs of conservation. Along with that, if we get this money, which is huge, um, again, my, the budget for wildlife diversity species is $2 million. The proposal for this bill would be that Ohio would get $28 million every year. So that would be, be a huge game changer. And um, so I want you to, with that, there's always a matching component. So if we get federal money, we have to have state match, and that would be a 25% match. So we have to have more state funding to get that federal funding. And that's how our business, it's the, again, it's the carrot for us. So where do we go? And a little bit of reflection. Um, just to give you a, a quick snapshot of Ohio and how we have supported things in the past, um, we have two different uh, ballot initiatives that have been supported. Um, Nature Works, which is supported overwhelmingly by the public, and the Clean Ohio Fund, which also was really overwhelmingly supported in Ohio. And this is a before and after shot of a project funded by Clean Ohio funds. Um, it's a vital component of supporting clean water and clean air and green spaces, and we know that Ohioans here support those concepts. They're, they're very supportive, and, and we feel very confident that they would support something else for wildlife conservation. So we look to the other states. What have they done for their state components? And we look at their funding mechanisms. We look at what's working, what's not working. And then, you know, we cannot do this without partnerships. Partnerships are vital to any kind of conservation improvement. And that's why I guess I'm glad you're all here today because you can certainly partner with us to, pr to promote, promote these things and influence um, people who have the power to vote for these types of things. So with that, um, really quick rundown of conservation history and how we're funded, my challenge to you today is will you stand up for conservation, just like all the hunters, anglers, and trappers that are currently doing that. And I'll wish you happy Thanksgiving, again, with our uh, wild turkey, and uh, that concludes my remarks. Thank you so much. Thank you for those remarks. So uh, moving on with our program, we have Naomi Edelson. Her bio's in the uh, um, um, uh, brochure that you have in front of you. And we're delighted to welcome her to Ohio and uh, um, to inform us about uh, all the great things she's doing and working on. Hello, everybody. Nice to be here. Some of my uh, colleagues are from here, some of the National Wildlife Federation alumni, with John Cantor was a student here, and Caitlin Shaughnessy. And I know we also have an alumni from our headquarters office where I am in Washington, D.C. Where's Vicki? Did she walk out? There's Vicki. 
And so uh, I'm very, very pleased. Thank you very much for inviting me. I am going to, uh, Ken Kendra showed us the history and the power of funding. And I'm gonna continue that theme for most of my presentation, but I'm also going to, at the end, talk about a brand new toolkit that's coming out that I created, which will talk about the funding, but also other aspects of how uh, we, particularly outside of the agencies, can play a role in being advocates for wildlife conservation. And so I am going to uh, cover a lot of ground in my time, and some slides might go by very quickly. But don't worry about that. You'll still get the gist of it, and I'm going to reinforce some of the messages Kendra has as well. Uh, so let me just say, for those of you, how many of you know, National, know who National Wildlife Federation is? Wow, this is great. All right, so we're older than, we're more than 75 years old. We have a network of affiliates. That's why we're a federation. And in Ohio, you, it's the Ohio Conservation Federation. We have a very strong advocacy arm that we work on clean air, clean water, environmental education, habitat conservation. We tackle, we work a lot on climate change in this era and we have been for a long time. And we have also a very long history of working on state wildlife funding, the issue that Kendra talked about. In fact, we, because we're, uh, 80, 75, 80 years old, we were around and helped start that very first user fee or excise tax on hunting equipment. We were one of the leading environmental groups, conservation groups to lead the charge on that. And then we did again in the 50s, and then part of what you, uh, Kendra, didn't really explain, and I'm not gonna go into detail, but we also did it in the 80s and in the 90s. In fact, Kendra and I met in the 90s and we have been working together for really more than 25 years now on this issue. And I have known her for that long time and she's been a phenomenal champion. And it's really a pleasure for me to be here while she's chief of the wildlife division and to see her leadership recognized. As far as I know, you're the first female chief of wildlife uh, in, at Ohio Division of Wildlife. And really she's one of only five in the whole country at once. So that's really a remarkable thing, and she really is the right leader for this agency. I'm very, very pleased to be able to talk about how we can help support her. Uh, I, um, so I wanna go, just go back to money, all right? That is, as we know, um, it, wh the, what's the saying? Money makes the world go around. We know that. We, you know, money is policy. A lot of people talk about in Washington, D.C., that's where I work, Washington, D.C., policy, this is the right policy, this is the right. Well, it's like money is policy. If you work on conservation funding, you are changing how wildlife is done. And we fund the things that we believe are important. It's that simple. And when you talked about having to go back every year and fight for things, everybody is funding, trying to fight for money, right? That's like a national pastime. I don't know, maybe not quite, but it's like, you know, it's a big thing to try to get to, to get that money. There's only a certain much amount of money and we all want part of it. So I do wanna um, provide to you an overview of some state funding mechanisms that have been successful and some of the ways that there are some leading states in the country that have generated millions of dollars for wildlife conservation, separate from the kinds of things that Kendra talked about. And, uh, but I'm also gonna focus on this federal bill, the Recovering America's Wildlife Act. How many people have heard of it? This is a very well-educated crowd. <laughs> this is great. Okay, some of you haven't, and I'm gonna, and some of you have, and I'm gonna talk to you very specifically about how you can help in that process. Ohio has a very important role, and uh, there's a lot of support already, but we need to get more. So I'm very much uh, looking forward to sharing that with you. All right, hold on here. Let me find the clicker. So again, some of these I'll go through fast. I just wanna give you our kind of slogan. This is our mission statement of how we are trying to tackle uh, wildlife conservation. And I'll talk a lot about uniting all Americans. Our affiliate, as I mentioned, is the Ohio Conservation Federation, a fairly new organization. And some of you, uh, how many people here know of the Ohio Conservation Federation? 
Okay, a smaller group. So you'll, and this afternoon, we're working with them and uh, the Ohio Division of Wildlife to um, have a session on, to dig in deeper on all of this and a campaign strategy meeting that we hope some of you will be able to join us for. So I think, as you saw from what Kendra said, we know that state wildlife agencies are really on the front lines of conservation and that we need to work actively with them as advocates and support their mission, and we need to be those voices for wildlife. Their job is to take care of wildlife for us, for the public, so to speak, and we really need to make sure that they have the support and the resources to do it. And as I said, I'm gonna cover a toolkit, which I'm gonna just introducing, it's really not even public yet, so you're just sort of getting a little taste of it, but it talks about funding, but not only about funding, but about having robust programs to meet all wildlife, uh, to take care of all wildlife and all the citizens of the state. It talks about capacity and the governance of agencies. So first I'm going to share with you uh, some of the state examples, and then I'll move into the Recovering America's Wildlife Act. So as, I'm not gonna repeat all this, but as uh, Kendra said, most state wildlife, it, the, what she described in Ohio is true for almost every state wildlife agencies. Almost none of them, with some notable exceptions, get so-called general funds from the legislature. It's, it's a remarkable situation where we started with a good idea, but we're at the point where it's not enough. The idea of having user fees on people who enjoy the outdoors was a great concept, and it translated and continues to into billions of dollars. But we are at the, we are at the limits of that ability. You know, when we did do that, we know it paid off, though. We have had tremendous success with wild turkey, pronghorn, striped bass, where I live in the Chesapeake Bay, and it's the white-tailed deer are so common that people, <laughs> insurance rates are higher in some regions of the country where there's a lot of white-tailed deer. So we've done a lot of really good things. But we really have not done that for all wildlife. And I think that the, the point Kendra showed about 1% of their budget being for wildlife diversity, which is 85% of the wildlife, so what do you think the consequences of that would be? We have what we uh, like to sort of call a, the quiet wildlife crisis. It's something most people are not aware of. Maybe you are, but I'm just gonna show you. And that's because, in part, we've neglected taking care of these species. We've actually, what I would say is we have had a bake sale approach to taking care of most of our nation's wildlife. It's like we're acting, asking our government who is supposed to take care of wildlife for us, to basically be an NGO, to be a non-government organization, and to do uh, you know, these tax checkoffs and license plates, and these are all individual donations. Why would we fund government that way? That's not appropriate. Are we gonna solve wildlife problems that way? No, <laughs> we know the answer. And monarchs are really one of the most visible examples. Monarch. Butterflies were once extremely common and abundant, very similar to the passenger pigeon. And I would say they're facing that very same fate. They were all over. They're well known. People learn about them in science classes. They're a beloved species. They're actually much more interesting for many people than the so-called charismatic megafauna that people think about. You might go to Yellowstone once in your life and see some of those amazing species. But monarchs, people see in their backyards. People love monarchs, but they are declining. So how did we let something like that happen? But it isn't just monarchs. There's many species at risk. A third of the species in the United States are actually at risk of extinction. Of these, 1,600 are already listed under the Endangered Species Act. And based on what state wildlife agencies have identified in their state wildlife action plans that Kendra showed, there's 12,000 and more species that have been identified as species of greatest conservation need. These are species that need, we'll talk more about that, proactive conservation help. So we know monarchs are declining and they've been petitioned to be listed and that they've lost as much as 80 to 90 percent, we've lost 80 to 90 percent of our monarchs. I mean, that's amazing. 
And we now know in a recent science article that came out from some of the most prestigious uh, ornithologists that we have lost in 2.9 billion individual birds since 1970. And again, that is another common species, the eastern meadowlark and the western meadowlark. We have lost three out of four of these individual birds in that time period. Cerulean warbler, not as common and well known as like a meadowlark, 74% decline. So we need a proactive conservation solution that will focus on the upstream solution of preventing wildlife from becoming endangered. And that's really the essence of what we need the funding for. We need to invest in these species so we can have those same successes that we have had for game. So at National Wildlife Federation, working with many partners, including a lot of the ones that are outside there, I saw we are working with many of them, we have created a campaign which is a threefold effort to elevate the wildlife crisis, to build a conservation army, and I'm going to talk a lot more about that, and to pass legislation at the federal and state level to secure funding to prevent wildlife from becoming endangered. And we know it's possible. We know people actually love wildlife, and when you can put things to the voters, it does translate into uh, significant funding. And Missouri, for example, a long time ago now, a long time, how many people were born? I mean, I'm not going to say that. A long time ago already, 1976, Missouri was the first state in the country. They put an extra sales tax, a little bit of money on each penny to go back to their Department of Conservation. And that, has tran that translated into $120 million every year automatically going for their Department of Conservation. In Arkansas, did the same thing, but it took them 20 years later, and they had several tries, and they did that, and that translated into 64 million every year going to that wildlife agency. In Minnesota, then they moved up, not quite 20 more years, but almost uh, 10. They uh, also did the same thing. They increased their sales tax a little bit on each penny, and they put it into these kinds of programs, and that's translated into over $300 million a year going back into conservation. We also have another model, which could be a good one for Ohio. Both Texas and Virginia, and one more state that I'm going to share with you in a second, redirected an existing sales tax on outdoor gear. So if you bought, uh, you know, not just hunting and fishing equipment, but binoculars and camping gear and all those kinds of things, every time you buy them at the store, there's a tax, right? On that goes into the general fund, and they, they figured out how much of that is from those, that kind of equipment, and they uh, redirected that back into a conservation fund. So that's been a very successful mechanism. And uh, Georgia recently, 2018, now we're in real time, just did that. They called it the Georgia Outdoor Stewardship Act. They uh, passed, they had to pass legislation they had to get the governor to agree to this idea of redirecting the sales tax, and then they had to put it on the ballot for all the voters. And it dedicated, as I said, the other ones, up to 80% of their existing sales tax. 20 million of that, that can generate between 20 million and 40 million. And they had to put in a provision to sunset it in 10 years, so they'll have to fight again for it, but at least they have 20 years. That's, I think, the best model out there. A lot of people want to know, what is the funding mechanism that works? I personally, you know, there's a lot of things to go into determining what's the way to do it, but that would be my recommendation um, to do that. And then some agencies have tried extractive fees. Nevada is one of them, is the successful with a fee on mining. Uh, Pennsylvania has tried to do a water consumption fee. And North Dakota and Pennsylvania tried to redirect the gas and oil fees to go back into a fund. But those last three haven't been successful yet. So now I'm going to move, I was talking about some state funding mechanisms, and now I'm going to move into the federal funding. So as uh, we talked about, federal funding back to states for preventing wildlife from becoming endangered is about $70 million a year. And that's the one we have to fight for every year. And that's the one that gives back uh, one, a little over a million to Ohio. It's considered, when people took these state wildlife action plans and added them all up, 
it came to 1.3 billion a year. That's what it would cost to implement all 50 state and territorial wildlife action plans. So the fact that there's 70 million going into those programs now means we only have 5% of what's needed. That's not gonna turn around the monarch butterfly or the cerulean warbler or the eastern meadowlark. And so this bill called Recovering America's Wildlife Act or HR 3742 was created to uh, create a dedicated annual funding towards proactive voluntary conservation for wildlife at risk. And the dedicated is the important part. Dedicated means it's mandatory spending. Every year it would automatically go back to these agencies. And that's a very big deal, and that's also a very big battle. That's really our biggest challenge on this bill, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. Out of that, 1.3 billion, the figure we talked about of how much it costs to implement these wildlife action plans, would go back to state wildlife agencies. We recently added a new title for tribes who have also been historically very, very underfunded, and they have managed a lot of land, and I'll talk about that in a minute. So they have a, an additional title in the bill of 97.5 million for tribes. And the premise is that this is good for wildlife, good for business, and good for taxpayers, because if we can take these measures early on, these preventative measures early on, before they need the emergency room of the Endangered Species Act, we will safeguard, we'll take care of wildlife, we'll reduce the cost for taxpayers, it's a, and we'll reduce the cost for businesses. It's the concept of, the, of having a common cold and treating it instead of waiting till you get pneumonia and end up in the emergency room where everything is riskier, it costs more, and uh, it's just not good for anybody. And so the idea, and we're finding a very good response to this, and I'll explain that in a minute. So uh, Kendra walked through this, so I'm not gonna spend much time, but the money can be used for a variety of things, species reintroduction, habitat restoration, the health and status of wildlife and habitats, and looking at what are the problems? Why do we have this particular problem and what are some of the practices we might need to do? Active habitat management to address that wildlife. This has, uh, we, uh, we talked about how it led to success. Here's an example. We're working with Congresswoman Debbie Dingell from nearby Michigan and Jeff Fortenberry. He's the man next to the um, banner. And uh, these two members of Congress, bipartisan, introduced the bill this past July. We've, ha we've actually been through a couple cycles, but we want to So Congresswoman Jeff Fortenberry, Republican from Nebraska, Debbie Dingell, uh, a Democrat from Michigan. And we see this as, this is National Wildlife Federation's top legislative priority, very top. We see this as a once in a lifetime opportunity and that this will be a game changer and I think we have that point already, but we talked about the difference that would go from Ohio from two to 28 million. These are some other examples of other states. It will change how we take care of wildlife conservation all over the country. And as I said, it will really help the tribes too. They manage themselves tens of millions of acres of land. They take care of over 525 federally listed threatened and endangered species. We need to absolutely help support their work. And we just did a fly-in with them, it was great. They got all these co-sponsors, it was really great. They just, they, they, this has galvanized them in a way it never has, other, any other issue has on working, at being advocates for conservation. The funding provisions include some of the money has to go to recovering those that already are threatened and endangered and some of it can be for recreation and education. Every state has to match it, so it even leverages more money. They have to match it by 25%. And it has to be used to recover and manage species of greatest conservation need, those 400 species in Ohio's plan. And it may be used for these other things, and we believe it will be. We think it should be also used for, again, providing more outdoor recreation opportunities for all kinds of outdoor enthusiasts and working with schools and working with nature centers and all the kinds of people who are very good at reaching out to the next generation. So our campaign is very simple. Again, just like I talked about before, we have three main prongs. 
And as to elevate the wildlife crisis, we did issue a new report with the American Fisheries Society and the Wildlife Society to look at how bad is it the problem. And I think, again, some species are so plentiful that people think wildlife is doing OK. And you can hear that in focus groups and surveys. But in reality, we have some severe, severe problems. And it is in every part of the country and every group of species. So we decided to elevate the wildlife crisis we actually brought live wildlife to the Capitol, and we got all kinds of people show up. They didn't care what we were talking about, but, but they got to come and see wildlife, but we, which was really fun. But we also took this monarch butterfly um, stuffed animal, and we brought it in on Valentine's Day, and we showed up, and we said, will you be my, uh, instead of saying, will you be my Valentine, we said, will you be my co-sponsor? And, it was, and we had a little card from all of our activists in their district who had written them a Valentine's Day card. And here we are with a member of Congress who actually, from California, who actually uh, represents one of the most important districts for monarchs. And then this year, we did something similar. Whoops, here we go. This is a little animated thing. We brought in uh, bald eagle stuffed animals to members of Congress and talked about how we've had a recovery of the bald eagle and how that took decades and how much you know, how people are so proud of the bald eagle. One congressman had a picture, you'll see it in a second, he had a picture right here of a bald eagle in his own office. And I said, that's great, let's take a picture of you holding this bald eagle. He's left a meeting with who knows who, and he came out to see the bald, the little plushie of a bald eagle. And he said, and then it turns out his daughter had uh, been the artist of that picture. It was quite amazing. So we have to capture the imagination of members of Congress, and we are. Our house plan for the members of Congress is to do a major co-sponsor drive to really focus on Republicans keeping it bipartisan. We've had a hearing. We're having a committee vote coming up probably in December, and eventually it'll go to the floor. So this has, by doing some of these sort of gimmicky things and basic work of reaching out to members of Congress, which we'll talk about in a second, we have generated 151 bipartisan co-sponsors. Actually, it's 100, I checked last night, it was 152. The tribes just got this really hard Republican to sign on, it was amazing. It was like, we've tried and tried, and they just came in, she signed on to the bill the next day. So we have to do that to show that this bill should pass. And we do think it's these basic messages which are why we're getting that kind of support. But we also know it's because it's, there's a big tent behind it. And we have been working hard to get birders and gardeners and hunters and anglers and hikers and paddlers and businesses to back this bill and contact their members of Congress. They like to hear, it's very important to hear from a lot of different voices. We have done that in several ways. One of them is we have a national sign-on letter, which I have uh, some hard copies of, and I'm going to show you where you can go. How many people? We'll here represent an NGO. I forgot to ask that. Okay, check to see if you've signed on to this letter. We have a lot of groups from Ohio that have, but if you haven't, we'd love to have you add your name. We have more than a thousand groups on here from a variety of interests, and showing that to members of Congress is a big deal. It really works. And then there's a question of what you can do to help individually. The most important thing is just contact your member of Congress. Once you've done that, you have to move on. Please ask your family, your friends, and your colleagues to help with that. There's a very easy way to do it at nwf.org, Recovering America's Wildlife. We have an action alert. You can fill in your name and your address, and it sends a message. You can customize it right to your member of Congress. Even if you don't know your member of Congress, it will, tell, it will send it to whoever it is based on your address. So we really uh, encourage people to take this simple action alert. And you can, we also encourage people to sign on the letter and to send it around to other groups that you would work with. It's very easy to do. That's on our website. And to talk it up, sharing on social media. We get more hits on this issue than any of our other issues that we do. We have a very active social media presence. And we have found that people love this issue. First of all, they love wildlife, but they love the idea of being proactive and preventing it from becoming endangered. Here's an example where we thanked the Tennessee Wildlife Federation. Our affiliate thanked their member of Congress, several of them for co-sponsoring the bill. That's a simple thing you can do. So if you go to NWF's uh, 
social media, Facebook and Twitter account. You can share our stuff or you can do your own. We use the hashtag uh, Recover Wildlife. And if you would like to be actively part of this campaign, we am happy to take your, uh, give me your card or give me your email address and I'm putting, sending out regular updates on where we are and what needs to be done. So now I'm going to transition back to this toolkit. So what I was trying to do was give you a lay of the land. Like these are some of the wildlife funding options. Here's a campaign that's underway. I mean, Recovering America's Wildlife Act is a big, big, big deal. There's a lot going on with that and we're having success. But it isn't so, you know, it's gonna take a lot more work to get that bill passed. And I did forget to say one thing importantly, in Ohio, we have six members of Congress who have already, are already co-sponsors, three Republicans and three Democrats. It's tremendous. But you have many others who could jo join and support that bill, but you already have a strong base of support. And also, Governor DeWine, he is, has joined a letter with other Great Lake governors to supporting Recovering America's Wildlife Act, and that is very significant. He is actually the first Republican governor in the country to do that, and we're very, very pleased. When he was a senator, I, we actually worked with him on something similar. He has a long history on this, and having the governor and having six members of Congress from your state on the bill is a big deal, and we'd love your help trying to kind of close the deal on this. Um, so when we, uh, hopefully you'll go to Recovering Amer our website, nwf.org, Recovering America's Wildlife. We have all kinds of information on there. Kendra has information on Ohio, and that's great. So what I wanna move into the last part of my talk is this idea of strengthening state wildlife agencies. And I've talked a lot about it, but I wanna be a little bit more specific here, especially as our role external to the agency. There are certain things agencies can do on their own and are trying very hard to do But us externally, we have a huge role in making these dreams really happen. You know, uh, and so we, we have created, as I said, a brand new toolkit, which has four main actions or four main chapters. One is on building a coalition. One is on elevating the wildlife crisis. Another is on engaging agency leadership. And the fourth is on securing funding. And you've already heard about all of that, right? We've talked a lot about that already. And that's sort of the gist of it. But, um, but this toolkit offers much more detail on how you can do it. It'll be the first time ever that there's, uh, when you look at funding, that we have a summary of how every major successful funding initiative has happened. We have lessons learned, we have articles about it, we have campaign plans, we have uh, polling results, we have all kinds of details so that when a state like Ohio wants to take this on, they don't have to start from scratch. They can look at everything else that's been done and they won't have to call 10 people and say, what did you do? We're trying to be a one-stop shopping spot for everybody on funding. But it's really about, uh, it's, it, and one of the things I've seen over and over is that people think the key to getting funding is to really identify the funding mechanism and that then if they do that, some states have had task force of very famous people who are gonna be the you know, ambassadors, and they've done a task force and they've put out their recommendations, but they didn't already have the support of people in a campaign ready to go. And it fell flat, frankly, and it didn't achieve what they want. So it's not about, people get very fixated on this idea, oh, we just find the silver bullet of how to get funding and then everything will happen, and it's not about that. We in the conservation community need to build this conservation army and have it ready to go. Um, our biggest contribution, I know many conservation groups do a lot of different things, but I, I, you know, on the ground work, we do monitoring with bird observatories, we do all kinds of you know, really good environmental education and so on, but the two pieces that we particularly have are to elevate the wildlife crisis and the coalition building, which will lead to a big tent for advocacy. And that this will be what it takes to create the political will to strengthen state wildlife agencies to be able to tackle these challenges for the next 100 years. And again, this idea that programs that are well supported are well funded. 
And it's really our job as NGOs to be the advocates. That's a very specific piece that agencies can't do on their own. It's our chance to use our voices to do that. And we know that, but what's happening is we're missing all those voices who care about conservation. We know every time you do polling, it's always very high, clean air, clean water, wildlife, it's really off the charts. But are those, is that showing up in the election results? Pretty much no, except when you can get something on the ballot and then people vote directly. It's largely ignored, and we need to harness these millions of, of Americans into a real conservation army. And Ding Darling was the founder of National Wildlife Federation, and he, won, he was a famous cartoonist, and I usually put up a picture, but I don't have it, actually. And one of his most famous cartoons shows garden clubs, hunters, birders, and others marching to the Capitol, U.S. Capitol, and demanding action. And that's really what we need to do. We need to create that conservation army, and we need to do it in two ways. We need to work to unite the existing conservation community and to expand this community. I think what's happened in the wild, current wildlife conservation community in a large part because of our funding history, there has been a very robust hunting and fishing community here. But the birders and the hikers and the paddlers, they're not all working together with the hunting and fishing community. It's become this uh, two-pronged effort when we overlap in so many ways. And it's not just that. It's like the hikers and the paddlers. Most of them don't even know what a wildlife agency is. They might know state parks, but they don't know who manages their wildlife in large part because of this user pay, user benefit mentality of really making sure to talk to the hunters and anglers the most because they pay the bills. And we need to create that much, much bigger tent. And it's not hard. We've done it a lot, and we need to do it again. And that's really what it'll take to get the public's attention. But it isn't just about that, the hunters and anglers and the hikers and the paddlers and the birders. It's also about reaching, our biggest challenge is reaching the urban community which is 80% of our nation's population. I mean, I live in an urban area. And, um, and one of the best ways to reach the urban community who are highly likely to vote in favor of conservation, very highly, off the charts, you know, and they're very supportive even if it's not part of their daily lives. But there are 90 million gardeners. And if we can... Uh, you know, galvanize their support, and they are amazing advocates. They are not afraid to, uh, many of them, some of these, a lot of them are led by women, and they are very unafraid to use their voice for power. And so we, that's a very good example of the kind of conservation army we need to build, and the toolkit walks through talking points for those different audiences and such. The second chapter is about elevating the wildlife crisis. And I'll just say there, the monarch is really the best example. The monarch butterfly, when you can talk about a species that people care about, we have, you know, when you had an Ohio, I know, pollinator summit, more than 300 people showed up to care about the monarch and other, other uh, pollinators, and it's a really big deal. And so if we don't talk about the crisis, we won't, uh, we, we won't get their support. That's an important part. The very last chapter that I didn't talk about already talks about engaging, inspiring, and supporting state wildlife agencies. I interviewed a bunch of former state wildlife directors and talked with them, and they said, you know, these are the things you need to do to help make our agency address all the future challenges. You need to show up at commission, what we call commissioner board meetings in Ohio. It's the council. What is it called? The council of wildlife, the wildlife council. And this is, and you need to show up whether or not it's a hot button issue to meet regularly with people like Kendra and some of the other uh, division of wildlife staff that are here and to recruit the directors and commissioners for these uh, positions, to really be thinking about who are gonna be there are great leaders. And again, in Ohio, you have a fantastic leader right now. We want people like Kendra all over the country who are thinking about the future, not just about how we've done it, but where we need to go. And we need to ensure that these councils or advisory boards or commissions look like America in gender, race, and interests. They still 
primarily represent one part of the population, and if we're really gonna take care of all wildlife, they need to reflect all the people and show the investment we all have in wildlife. And I'll, I'll just say in closing that, um, you know, reversing the wildlife crisis may indeed take time, and you know, but we can't wait for things to change by default. We can't wait for the right political leader or the perfect climate. There, people have waited for decades, and it's never, you know, they wait for the right time, and that's not what it is. It's about being bold, and it's about going ahead and leading and taking action. And to me, the best example of that is Greta Thornburg. Look what she did in a year. She's amazing. She just went out and did something, and she started this climate strike and said, I'm not going to go to school on Fridays. And this past uh, month, my son took her idea, and he got two-thirds of his seventh grade to not go to school and to go to the climate strike. And his school approved it. They were like, sure, you should do that. It was, you know, so some people were like, oh, it's not really a strike because you didn't, you know, you had permission. It was a climate strike, but look what she did. She was one person in one year, started it. A year later, millions of people all over the globe took on what she did. And that's our job to do that, to be bold and lead and step up for wildlife. So thank you. Thank you. So... We have time for about 15 minutes of questions, so please raise your hand and I'll run a microphone over to you. Need some time to process. Um, as someone that doesn't usually fish or hunt, but partakes in outdoor activities such as like backpacking or other outdoor sports, um, currently what is the best way for me to support conservation through like my own funding and my own power? Okay, this one. Well, thank you for your question. Um, again, there were some other funding mechanisms on there like the Ohio Wildlife Legacy Stamp, you can purchase that for $15, and that goes specifically into the Wildlife Diversity Fund. I would still strongly encourage you to think about purchasing a fishing license or a hunting license because even if you don't participate, we use that license to count, and we get more federal funding because of that license. So your, federal, your license will be multiplied um, by receiving more federal funds. So um, I still encourage you to do that. Now, to have a hunting license, you do need to pass hunter education, um, but we do have an apprentice license that you can purchase without any hunter education, and that's to go out and hunt with somebody who's already licensed. So even if you don't actively participate, just having that license shows your financial commitment to wildlife conservation in Ohio. And you can contact your member of Congress. Yeah. <laughs> and you should then send a thank you to Governor DeWine. Actually, anybody who has a member of Congress, the, the six that have supported the bill, which uh, <clears throat> you can go to congress.gov and look up the bill, Recovering America's Wildlife Act, and it'll tell you all the members of Congress that are supporting it, and you can sort it by Ohio. You can thank them if they're your con member of Congress, but Governor DeWine is really going to be a great leader in this, and that, that's a simple thing you can do either on social media or otherwise, but you can contact your member of Congress. How does this House Wildlife Bill stand in the Senate? We are waiting <laughs> for, uh, to get the bill introduced. We are working hard to get uh, a bipartisan bill, and so we, um, have, don't have, uh, we don't have a Republican sponsor yet. So that is our biggest challenge, and we've talked with a lot of people, and we're engaged in some very interesting discussions with some member senators who are in very, very high level. You can, right, you can contact Senator Portman. He'd be a great one. He has a similar bill that he supports on dedicated funding for parks. We'd love him to be a leader for wildlife. Um, ladies, um, can you please um, explain how many sponsors you have in total for that bill right now, and who, if any, are opposition to that bill? We have 152 members of Congress, and it's almost even, it's almost, uh, 
it's like a third Republican, two thirds Democrat, which is how the House is currently. That's the basic formula ratio. And so we feel very good about that. Um, the, there are some members who are not, uh, haven't gotten on yet, let's put it that way. Some of them have said, no, we don't want to, it costs too much. And we are really, that's our biggest obstacle is the price tag. So that's why we need not just a few people to talk about it, but many, many, many. And I think it's again this idea that taking preventive action saves money in the long run. Uh, but it, they just have to hit home. Like this, I was talking about this congresswoman from uh, Washington that has not been supporting the bill until she heard from the tribes. I mean, a lot of people have talked with her, but uh, you know, it took even more to talk to her. So we have to overwhelm them, basically. I guess I noticed noticed on your list uh, pheasant target to bring back. How likely is that? It seems like uh, since the 70s, they've virtually disappeared from the wildlife. Okay, so in terms of pheasant population, yes, they have definitely changed on our landscape due to the um, landscape agricultural practices, removing of, uh, the you know cover that they had in the farm. Fence rows was very helpful. So we are actively working on different grassland projects through our private lands biologists primarily on private land, as well as our state wildlife areas, to improve habitat and to bring back pheasants. We still stock pheasants um, at this time, uh, because again, hunters want to have those out there, but it's you know, really truly best to have a wild reproducing population. So we will continue those efforts, we aren't going to give up, and hopefully we'll find that magic uh, answer. That's one of the reasons I think Pheasants Forever, who's been a very, very strong advocate for wildlife conservation, they're a very excellent organization. I mean, there's many excellent organizations, but that's why they're taking on the monarch butterfly. They've become one of the biggest advocates for that because of the same issues that are facing pheasants are facing monarchs. Same habitat. What do you guys think is the best way to sort of like, or most effective way to promote empathy in people for wildlife? Because for myself, and I'm sure I speak for a lot of people here, um, a lot of what we do is like, we're the ones like fighting for wildlife and why people should care about it. Uh, but for me, a question that I get a lot is, you know, like, why should I care about that duck out there? I'm not a duck, you know, like how, how why should I care? Why should my money go toward protecting that duck? So what do you think is like the best way to promote empathy in people for that? Oh yeah, well, get them outside. That's, you have to have that connection with the outdoors, and if you have that connection with the outdoors, you will understand and you will have more, more feelings toward that, like, hey, I want to see that thrive and persist, and I want, I want to enjoy that. So it really is getting people outdoors. Now, you can show them beautiful images. You can show them great shows. You know, I, I like watching shows about Alaska. I haven't been to Alaska, but I love watching the shows. Um, but getting them outdoors is the number one thing you can do to help people understand about nature and connect with it. One of the other things, you know, we actually went yesterday, uh, Kendra and I and uh, the Ohio Conservation Federation, we met with the Columbus Dispatch, the editorial page, one of the writers, and to, we're hoping to get them to, to look for the, look, go out and get the Columbus Dispatch. And let's see if they get an editorial on supporting Recovering America's Wildlife Act. But she asked us that question too. And I think that one of the other angles, I mean, I think getting outside is one of the most important things. Although I'll tell you, my son, he's like, oh, mom, do we have to go in nature again? <laughs> I'm like, I'm trying to like, you don't have that problem, Kendra. We have a child born the same day, the same year, but two different kids, right? Not together. Uh -huh. <laughs> Although, I think I'd like to be in your family. Looking at her Facebook page, oh my God, they have so much fun. But anyway, um, yeah, so getting them outside, but it's also about making, talking about like the canary in the coal mine issue of, these are indicators for the quality of our lives, and they need clean water, and if they're not out there, it means the water and the air aren't clean, which is, affects us. And I do think connecting it with that is a very important way to do it, and people do understand that concept. And uh, it's been very hard, like one of the species that's in a lot of trouble is freshwater mussels. And like, who the heck cares about freshwater mussels, right? They're not even pretty. I mean, they could be pretty to some biologists. They are very beautiful. But in general, like putting up a picture of um, mussels doesn't generate anything like the monarch. But 
they are our clean water filters. And having them in our streams, make they actually do the work for us as opposed to just putting in a lot of, I mean, we also have to have the sewage systems and all those other things, but they provide that. And so making that connection with how it affects people's lives and that it actually will improve people's lives. And it's also an economic thing for some places, particularly in rural communities now, the outdoors, you know, like you were saying, I didn't know the, uh, is it Lake Erie, is it, what's that place called, Pile, is it Peely, Lake Peely? No, the place in, that's a top birding spot, one of the, in one of the top birding spots in uh, the nation, that's amazing. That brings in huge amounts of money. Um, hi, uh, do you guys think that um, uh, putting a tax on the hunters and fishers when they buy these licenses um, is the most efficient way to, to go about funding the um, basically conservation of wildlife or I mean rather than um, taxing the industries that are directly like harmful to wildlife and biodiversity in general like petrochemical companies and I mean uh, fertilizer companies and pesticides and whatnot. So oh, I think uh, it's an interesting dilemma. And in the 30s, when they tried this with putting in a fee for hunters and anglers, um, it was really about saying, we've had enough, and we better do something for wildlife. It also was a time when there was severe overhunting. So they were having a huge impact on wildlife. And, but I, and, so, and there are fees. Like when, when any oil company or gas company drills on federal public land, there are fees that they pay, and that goes into a pot of money federally called the land, and one of the funds is the Land and Water Conservation Fund, which is used primarily for buying uh, land. And so there are fees on them, and there are people who are trying to add that to other extractive industries. I mean, we have a... Uh, that won't happen under this uh, president. And, um, and it's a tough sell for a lot of Western members, period, who use the land that way. But, um, you know, it's like, I think we need a little bit of everything. That's kind of my opinion. It could be a lot of different things. But the reality is we have to do something. Be, we have to figure out what's, in some ways, sometimes it's like, if you do those, like they tried in North Dakota, they tried to, and Pennsylvania, to put these extra taxes, not just on the federal, but on state, and it was supposed to go back for wildlife conservation, and those industries fought back pretty hard, and um, I actually talked with one of the companies later, and he said, we probably shouldn't have done that, and I was like, wow, maybe they should try again, and, uh, but, you know, you have to be pragmatic about getting funding, and you don't, if there's a huge amount of opposition, then you just won't get the bill done. So that's, I guess, kind of a, you know, there might be a philosophical thing that you believe, and then there may be a pragmatic path forward. All right, thank you. I guess you have to stop now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you want, do you have any, do you, okay, okay. Well, that'll wrap it up today here. Um, we'll um, uh, wrap up and you can visit with some of the speakers um, immediately afterwards, as is our tradition. We have um, two certificates of appreciation that we'd like to give you for um, participating in our Environmental oh. Professionals Network uh, Thank program. You. Thank you very much. That concludes our progr program today. For those of you in attendance who'd like to learn more about future EPNs, you can do so by uh, uh, signing up at our epn.osu.edu site and learning about all the future programs. Uh, join us at our next meeting on December 4th, where we'll be celebrating World Soils Day, which is actually on December 5th. Um, learn about its origins from a video prepared by Libertan Lal, one of its global, global champions and a Japan Prize winner. You will also hear from our state conservationist, Terry Cosby, as well as soil science leaders from across our state, including our soil laboratory, and how it provides hands-on experiences in the form of ecosystem remediation projects that include Ohio State faculty and students, local NGOs, and the cities of Mansfield and Columbus. You, you register today at epn.osu.edu for that. Also, please save the date for January 14th. I always love it when we have these sort of like unique hooks for these. We're going to be talking about the bourbon barrel connection, revitalizing Appalachian Ohio economics in the oak-dominated forest. Registration for that program will be available soon, and you can see some background on that program in your brochure. 